Welcome to the New Books Network. Hi, this is Jim Stein, your host for New Books and Math, a channel of the New Books Network. Our guest today is John Stilwell, author of The Story of Proof. This book could well serve as a history of mathematics, because in developing the evolution of the concept of proof and how it has arisen in the various different mathematical fields, John essentially traces the important milestones in the development of mathematics. John has done an amazing job of collecting and categorizing many of the most important ideas in this area. John, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. And a pleasure to have you. John, what motivated you to write this book? Well, I've, I've been disappointed for some time at sort of the lack of respect for proof in, in mathematics education. Uh, I've been teaching in America, or I was teaching in America for the last 20 years, and typically proof is introduced only at fairly senior levels of undergraduate as if it was something sophisticated too sophisticated for beginners whereas whereas i think proof runs through all of mathematics it's the essence of mathematics really and there should be some concept of proof from the very beginning yeah i I certainly agree with you i mean but one question that would arise is uh when I took geometry in high school, and I don't want to tell you how many years ago that was, mm-hmm. we were first familiarized with the concept of two-column proofs, and somebody tell, told me that they're not doing that in geometry anymore. Is that true? Well, I don't really know, but as I understand it, a two-column proof is in the left-hand column, you you make certain statements, and in the right-hand column, you explain why. Or exactly. Justifications. So if, if it simply means justifying claims that then fair enough um you don't have to you don't have to lay it out in two columns you just have to provide justification as you go along and and typically that that would be saying by axiom so and so or because this follows from line three and line 17 um well, I hope that, they're doing the way... that in geometry. I mean, I can see discursive proofs. That's what you see in math, in, you know, in a more standardized math course in, at a college or in a journal article. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it is done in, in some form, but the the very idea of proof is sort of suppressed. You might be you might do proofs and some people might not do proofs, but the, the students are not alerted that there is a process called proof and it, it has certain characteristics, and, and it is really itself a part of mathematics. I certainly agree with you. Before we get into the meat of the book, since you spent so much time studying proof, do you have a favorite proof or, and or a favorite proof technique? I, I would say my favorite proof is a proof of the Pythagorean theorem, um, probably a very ancient proof. We don't know for sure when it first originated. It's... it's um, perhaps not as fancy as Euclid's proof and not as strict as Euclid's proof, but it's very convincing. You simply draw a picture. You take your right angle triangle. You take four copies of the triangle and you arrange them in a square uh, and you will see if, if you arrange them sort of head to tail that the space in the middle that's left over is simply the square on the hypotenuse. But then you notice you can arrange the four triangles in the same square in a different way so that the space left over is the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Therefore, sum of the squares on the two sides equals sum on the hypotenuse, QED. Yeah, I love it. That's one of my favorite proofs, too. You know, the initial proof of a theorem is often quite inelegant and overly lengthy. Certainly a lot of mine were. Why do you think mathematicians spend so much time searching for better ways to prove a theorem once the result is known to be true? Well, uh, of course, most mathematicians appreciate elegance, and if the proof is ugly for some reason, they would try to find a better one. But there are other reasons. One would be to find a better explanation. The the first proof may be so contorted and, and long that you don't really see the reason why the theorem is true, and it, there might be a more explanatory proof, such as the, the proof of the Pythagorean theorem I just mentioned. Another another reason and motivation is that you want to find what is the minimum that you really have to assume to prove the theorem. Very often the first proof assumes everything under the sun, uh, 
just because it's convenient and you would like to trim it down so only the really necessary assumptions are present yeah i think that's a really good point because i mean i know that uh having done some research mathematics myself one of the things that i would often do is uh exactly what you mentioned i'd look at a theorem and i'd see whether or not i could get by with less or could possibly reach a stronger conclusion from what the author had assumed yes that that that's precisely what a lot of people do of course a lot of research mathematicians are in a hurry and once they've proved the theorem, they want to forget it and go on to something else. But uh, yeah, shiny new toys. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm not satisfied with that, <laughs> and, and I'm not producing so many theorems that I can I, I can afford to rush on to the next one. Yeah. Well, you mentioned in the preface that logic and computation are important tools for proof, yet logic and computation are less well known than other aspects of mathematics. Why do you think this is the case? Um, it, it puzzles me a bit because they were the two things that really interested me as an undergraduate. But um, then I wasn't at first interested in number theory or algebra or algebraic topology. And, and a lot of the fashionable areas of mathematics uh, don't pay a lot of attention to logic. So I think it's partly what's fashionable, but it may be the way some mathematicians think they they prefer logic to be sort of unconscious and and they don't want to examine the mechanics of a proof um whereas i i do like to look at the mechanics i like to see how the the pieces fit together and and logic helps you to do that um, I certainly think that's true. You know, you were referring to the Pythagorean theorem earlier, and uh, it has a central place in mathematics. I mean, I think it's the most important theorem in mathematics. I remember reading that Pythagoras, once he had proved it, ordered 100 oxen barbecued, and I don't think there's a single theorem that's been proved that's even worth 60 oxen since then. <laughs> um, I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, do you suppose you could trace a little bit of its history and how establishing it contributed to the evolution of proof it must have done so because i think there are like 400 different proofs of it so people have looked at this in the context of proof as well as in the context of geometry yes yes that's true i and and not only geometry because um some several different civilizations discovered the pythagorean theorem um even before pythagoras even um but they they saw only certain aspects of it. For instance, the Babylonians seem to have um, been interested in the number theory a, uh, aspect. When you have numbers such as three, four, and five, and three squared plus four squared equals five squared, this is an interesting relationship between numbers. And you might look for many other triples, Pythagorean triples, as they call. And the Babylonians were amazingly good at this, and they they found examples up in the thousands. Wow. Uh, so that's what that that's one way it can develop a, and contribute to mathematics. It contributed to number theory by by posing a problem, find integer solutions of the equation a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Then, as you said, uh, it contributed a lot to geometry because people wanted to know what is the the real reason for the Pythagorean theorem. So they proved it many different ways. And basically, it, it boiled down to the parallel axiom of Euclid. You can't prove it without the parallel axiom, though this might not be obvious in it's some of the It's certainly not books. obvious to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but um, if, you, if you look carefully at, say, Euclid's proof, Euclid does not introduce the parallel axiom. He, he sort of avoids it for as long as possible, but he has to bring it in when he's discussing the theory of area, area of parallelograms, for example, and triangles, uh, which, which, of course, require parallels. So uh, Euclid saw that he needed the parallel axiom to prove the Pythagorean theorem. And conversely, if you assume the Pythagorean theorem, you're assuming that squares exist and, and therefore parallels exist and the parallel axiom sort of follows. So it's kind of the essence of geometry in one sense is the Pythagorean theorem. In another sense, it's the 
parallel axiom, at least Euclidean geometry. I, I guess we might talk about non-Euclidean later, but everything begins Euclidean style with parallels and squares and the Pythagorean theorem. Oh, and the third thing that contributed uh, to mathematics was the the role of the square root of two. The Pythagorean theorem tells us that if you've got a square with sides one and one, the, the hypotenuse is the square root of two, um, which it was interesting and shocking to the Pythagoreans because they discovered that root two is not a ratio of whole numbers. Until then, they'd thought that everything is whole numbers. Uh, so this completely upset their whole theory of everything, as it were. And uh, it, it, it uh, was a thorn in the side of Greek mathematics for hundreds of years, which eventually forced them to develop a theory of real numbers in, in a kind of rudimentary form. And as we know today, there are all sorts of holes in the rational numbers. Root 2 is just one of them. And to fill them in, you've got to create a theory of real numbers. So Pythagorean theorem, in its way, contributed to that development as well. You know, I've always been impressed by the fact that the Greeks knew that there were five regular polyhedra. I took a course in solid geometry in high school, which was probably the hardest math course I ever took. But I don't think we got to the proof that there were five and only five regular polyhedra. But I think that the proof is in included in Euclid's elements. Is that correct? Uh, it, it is. And it, it's, it's really the climax of Euclid's elements. Every, everything he's done, or a lot of what he does in that book, leads up to the proof. Now, it's, it's not particularly hard to prove that there are most five, the, the five that we know of, the tetrahedron cube up to the dodecahedron, icosahedron. But what is hard, uh, surprisingly, is to prove that a dodecahedron actually exists. You, you can prove that pentagons exist, but how, do you, how can you be sure when you stick them together in three-dimensional space that they're going to close up and make this nice regular object? It's, it's quite hard to do that, and, th and that's why Euclid took a long time to get there. You know, I uh, this is this is sort of a sidelight, but I've always been impressed by how incredibly brilliant the Greeks were, considering that they didn't have you know pencils and papers to just scratch out ideas when it occurred to them. Um, they didn't have really good you know really good writing implements and recording devices, and yet they still got all this incredible mathematics done. Yeah, I, I suppose. There is that story about Archimedes drawing in the sand, and yeah. I suppose that that kind of predisposed them to geometry. You could draw triangles and circles and so forth, uh, but you couldn't calculate very well drawing in the sand. Uh, there was the abacus at some stage in the history of mathematics, I'm not sure when, which enabled calculation, but the, the Greeks were not either not doing it or not interested, I would say. So they, they had this, this bias towards geometry, um, and the, the root two business also scared them off number theory. So um, they, they managed to do geometry the hard way, as we would see it, but were incredibly good at it. Yeah, they sure were. You know, calculus is what attracted me to mathematics. Finding the volume of a sphere is a slam dunk using integral calculus, but I have absolutely no idea how the Greeks managed it, and maybe you could give me some insight on this. Um, yes, um, Archimedes is, is responsible for the for theorem, <clears throat> and the way he visualized it was he enclosed the sphere in a cylinder, so the, the the top and bottom of the cylinder top touched the sphere at the top and bottom, and the curved side of the cylinder touches the sphere around its its equator. And he considered slicing through the sphere, small slices. Now, uh, w the way he did this was complicated, and uh, strangely, it involved a bit of physics. He he imagined weighing things and. Uh, balancing things on a lever, and, and uh, the, there's a there's a lot of tricky reasoning. Later on, in the, the 17th century, Cavalieri did a a new approach which was similar to Archimedes, but he compared the sphere in the cylinder with a cone in the cylinder, 
And the, the volume of the cone was known because basically you could slice it into very small tetrahedra or almost. Uh, and it's, this volume is one third base times height. And he was able to compare the inside of the sphere with the outside of the cone and show that they're the same volume. And this is easy, actually. You slice through at the same height and the slice inside the sphere is the same area as the slice outside the cone. So adding up all the slices, a slightly dodgy procedure, you get equal volumes and therefore the sphere is two-thirds of the volume of the cylinder, which was Archimedes' way of putting the result. Well, to me, that's incredible, considering that the idea of slicing occurs naturally when you're using integral calculus. And once you have something like the fundamental theorem of calculus, literally, these are 30-second problems. And the, there were a couple of moments for me when I thought that mathematics was just so astounding. That was one of them. The other was the fact that when I found out that sine x was x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 oh, oh. factorial. Uh, and we might get to have, we might get to that later because that's absolutely my favorite theorem in mathematics. Oh, oh, oh I, 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 admire, I admire that one too. Yeah, Taylor was but, just but, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Uh, uh, Archimedes, without a, ma- a means of calculation, could do things that we now do by calculus. It, it was amazing. Yeah, that's why I say these guys were just unbelievably brilliant. Um, because, uh, I, you know, I've, I've heard some mathematicians beside yourself uh, talk about uh, the way that the Greeks approached, approached some of these more complicated problems. And they all realize that these are intellectual tour de forces, which the discovery of calculus is an intellectual tour de force, but the use of calculus is not. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, it's the the theoretical part that's that's amazing. Once once you've got the theory, then you can see it applies to physical objects. Um, okay, let's look at some different branches of mathematics because that's in a sense that's how you've organized your book. So Kronecker yes. said that the integers were the result of God; all else was the result of man. But you mentioned the proof of the square root of two being irrational. Um, we've been doing a lot of work with those uh, non-integer results and the rationals, the transcendentals, etc. And maybe you'd like to talk a little because you started talking about this earlier when we developed the real numbers. So maybe you'd like to talk a little about that uh yes that that's uh, bringing us up to the 19th century uh and chronica was a 19th century mathematician very interested in numbers uh, but even he was uh, forced to use transcendental numbers in some of his work e- even though he's sometimes quoted as saying he didn't believe in them he he did did use them and his way around that was to consider not only natural numbers but infinite processes on the national no- natural numbers like, like the infinite series of sign that you just mentioned you can you can make rational numbers and you can start adding them and you if you add more and more you may, the sum may approach something interesting uh, and we now know that you can get all real name numbers in this way um, dedicant all had it very different way of approaching that and that was to consider infinite sets of rational numbers imagining root 2 for instance as a separation of the rational numbers into those that are less than root 2 and those that are greater than root 2 now you, you can describe all real numbers in this way by the way they separate the rational numbers into two parts um, Kronecker didn't like this because this involves infinite sets, which he, he was leery of. But Dedekind was perfectly happy to use infinite sets of real or, or rather rational numbers. And uh, this, this idea caught on in the 19th century. And it began to be believed that everything could be arithmetized in, in the sense that it was either reducible to natural numbers or infinite sets of natural numbers. So... They took a Greek idea and pushed it a little further because Greeks, the Greeks didn't like to accept infinite sets as completed wholes. And Dedekind and others were willing to do this. And in, in that way, they pushed the, the theory of real numbers in, into, uh, into reality. It, it was something approachable only vaguely before then. 
that if you accept infinite sets, it's a concrete, actual thing. Yeah, I remember um, there was uh, a lot of difficulty in accepting the works of uh, Cantor um, on infinite, uh, you know, on on uh, infinite sets. And I remember that my I had originally thought uh, that Cantor was this individual who was uh, um, uh, essentially uh, essentially vilified by the German mathematical establishment. But I've later found out that that wasn't necessarily true. What happened was they held him in a lot of respect for the work that he did in other areas. But when he started messing around with infinities, they got very upset about it. Maybe that was the uh, holdover from Kronecker. Uh, yes, yes. I, I think Kronecker was hostile to Cantor, but, but Dedekind was not. Dedekind was quite friendly, and, and he corresponded a lot with Cantor. And 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 Cantor's essentially great contribution was to discover that infinite sets are of more than one kind. Uh, we know that the natural numbers are infinite and form an infinite set. They go one, two, three, and they never end. Uh, and it was thought perhaps for a while that all infinite sets could be viewed in this way as, as going first member, second member, third member, but never ending. Uh, but Cantor showed that the real numbers are not like this. You cannot begin to enumerate the real numbers and say first real number, second real number, third real number, and exhaust them all by imagining continuing that process. It just cannot be done. Uh, so there was, it was impossible to think of the real numbers as a process, a step-by-step process that could be approached. Um, and this was shocking to people like Kronika, not shocking to Dedekind, but uh, it certainly disturbed a lot of mathematicians uh, in the 19th century. Yeah, I think that this particular proof technique, the diagonal proof is worth, or the diagonal technique, is worth mentioning because it just permeates so many different areas of mathematics. I mean, I look at Cantor as one of, you know, Cantor hit for the cycle. He had uh, objects named after him, he had theorems named after him, and he had a proof technique named after him. And there are very few mathematicians who have something like that on their resume. Yes, the... The, the diagonal argument, I think, is one of the great ideas of, of mathematics. And it's quite a simple idea, really uh, a, a hard to describe um, on the radio. Yeah, you need to but, see a proof but, in but order to you, appreciate you need it. To see, but you, you need to see the, the real numbers <laughs> d- written out and the diagonal drawn and so forth. But essentially what it says is that if you've got a list of real numbers, first real number, second real number, third real number, you can make a number that's not on the list. And you can make it in a very constructive way. And, and because of this, the same technique uh, applies to other situations. For instance, if you had a list, list of computable functions, you can make a function which is not computable, or you can define one at any rate. Uh, this, was, this was an idea that was taken up by Turing, for instance. And uh, if, you, if you try to analyze what goes wrong, why can't you compute this non-computable function? You find, you realize that it's because there are unsolvable problems about computing machines or, or algorithms. And this leads to unsolvable problems in, throughout mathematics. It leads to incompleteness, the impossibility of proving everything. So all of these results are descendants of Cantor's diagonal argument. Yeah, you know, when you're talking about problems that could not be solved, one of the great results in the development of algebra and indeed in the development of mathematics was Galois' proof of the insolvability of the general quintic. This problem has a long and fascinating history and an amazing culmination. And maybe you could tell us a little about it. Yes, it, it, the history is, is, is uh, fascinating. It's dramatic. It goes through the solution of quadratic equations and cubic equations, and there was a lot of fights about that in fourth-degree equations, but nobody could solve the fifth-degree equation. And um, this was baffling because it seemed that you just had to be a little more clever because solving cubic was a lot harder than solving quadratic. So solving fourth degree was a bit harder than solving cubic. Uh, so it held mathematics up for 
a couple of centuries before Galois was able to show that you've got to think on a different level. You've got to think about the nature of equations, the nature of the roots of equations, and particularly the symmetry of the roots. Uh, a quintic equation has five different roots. And Galois imagined what happens when you interchange, write the roots in a different order, what happens? Uh, and he realized that there is a whole theory of symmetry and by studying this which we now call group theory you can come up with some concepts which explain what is happening when you solve the the quadratic cubic fourth degree equations and why you cannot solve the the quintic so he, he not only proved that it was unsolvable but he came up with a a comprehensive theory which settles all kinds of questions not only to do with equations, but with geometry and, and physics or many other things now involve group theory, the theory of symmetry. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> you know, one of absolutely the most, uh, you know, the most fascinating anecdotes in mathematics is the idea that Galois, uh, Galois presumably was uh, having an affair with uh, the wife of a nobleman, and the nobleman challenged him to a duel, and Galois basically knew that he wasn't going to survive the duel. He was like 21 years old, and so on the night before the duel, he spent his uh, last hours on Earth writing down the proof uh, uh writing down the proof of this amazing result to me that's just one of the great anecdotes in mathematics yeah yes one of the great tragedies really but luckily he wrote he wrote enough that it was eventually understood but uh at the time i think he sent it to Koch standard and, and didn't think it was worth pursuing and it was 10 10, 15 years, I think, before Leoville took the time to read math, uh, the, the mathematics of Galois carefully and figure out what was going on and, and finally convince people that Galois had really proved this result. I mean, if, it, if I hate to say it, but if it had been me, I would have been on the first train out of France even though they didn't have <laughs> And so I could do some more math. Good grief. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Galois was, cause, was a kind of angry young man, I think, and, and uh, he, uh, didn't, he didn't consider his future as much as he should have. You know, it's sort of like my wife. My wife t seems to think that I'm not as practically oriented as I could be, and I spend too much time thinking about mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess that's what mathematicians do. We spend a lot of time thinking about mathematics and we tend to neglect other things that are more important. But I know I remember to keep my doctor's appointments. And if anybody ever challenges me to a duel, I'm moving to another country. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. I, I would agree with you. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, uh, speaking of the 18th century, which was when uh, Galois was around, some really important mathematics and proof techniques have arisen from what we now think of as recreational mathematics. And the Königsberg bridge problem, which marks a milestone in the development of combinatorics, is one of these. And it has a fascinating theory, some fascinating people in it, and a fascinating resolution. Hopefully you'll tell us about it. Yes, yes, this was one of Euler's discoveries, at which, which he seemed to toss off uh, every day. But the Königsberg bridge, Bridges is, is, is a very lasting contribution because everybody can understand the problem. You, you have a city with, with a river and two islands and, and a few bridges, and people like to take walks along the bridges, and they wonder whether there's a walk which will use each bridge exactly once, and they can't ever find one but they don't know why not and they put the problem to Euler and he, he solves it very quickly by what we now know as graph theory he, he reduces it to a problem about um, dots which are the, the land masses and lines which are the bridges and imagines tracing a path through these lines and notices that each time you pass through a dot you would use up two of the edges and, and therefore, uh, unless you have all even numbers, uh, even numbers of edges at each dot, you're never going to be, be able to use them up uh, with, with a walk that uses each bridge exactly once. Um, a simple idea, but it led to a big field of graph theory and, and 
later to topology as well. Topology sort of generalizes from these one uh, dimensional objects called lines to two and three and four dimensional objects and and makes things by sticking them together and there are all kinds of problems all kinds of methods uh topology has been one of the most fruitful branches of mathematics in in leading to new methods of proof and um also new ideas in geometry you know one of the things that sort of interests me about proof is that there are some really simple proof techniques that occur in a lot of different areas and are so obvious. And one, um, as you were talking about Euler counting things associated with the various dots and lines connecting them, it occurred to me that one of the classic proof techniques, which we haven't really talked about yet, is the pigeonhole principle. Um, and uh, I always thought that was about the easiest proof technique to understand and maybe uh uh maybe you could uh shed some insight on when you first saw the proof technique uh, of the pigeonhole principle used in a proof um now that's a, that's a good question and as i recall um this this technique is is due to dirichlet and and he used it to prove a, a theorem about approximating irrational numbers by rationals and he went on to use it to, to prove that there's a solution of the Pell equation which is the equation x squared minus n y squared equals one where n is a whole number that's not a square for instance x squared minus two y squared equals one is a simple Pell equation and it's not at all obvious that there's all, always a solution of those equations for instance if you take x squared minus 61 y squared equals one the smallest solution has about 10 or 12 digits for each of X and Y. And yet, Dirichlet was able to prove its existence by this simple pigeonhole principle, which, which says you, if you've got N pigeonholes and more than N pigeons, there's going to be at least two pigeons in one pigeonhole. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's it's so completely obvious, and yet nonetheless, because I, I used it a few times, and uh, I worked in some areas in combinatorics later in my career, and I was amazed at how useful uh, this particular technique is, and I thought it, one of the reasons that I asked you about this was because I thought it was such an obvious thing, it might have been traced back to the Greeks, but the Greeks were investigating geometry, and this type of proof doesn't really show up in geometry no no it, it doesn't and uh, as far as i know it, it doesn't show up till fairly late in the piece this this dirichlet proof is probably 1830s there may be examples before then but it it got its name the the pigeonhole principle i think from dirichlet so maybe it wasn't used before him well, another another proof principle um, that I always liked because of the name of it was the Chinese restaurant principle. Um, in counting uh, in counting the number of ways that you can do several different things um, because I used to go to these Chinese restaurants when I was a kid and I remember um, they had a menu in which said you know the dinner you could choose one from column and you could choose an appetizer from uh, column uh -huh. a a, uh, a main course from column B and this was the first math question that really sort of interested me because I asked my father how many my father would always order different meals whereas I always had had the same thing and I asked my father how many different types of meals you could have and uh, he said well you know there are eight appetizers and there are 12 main courses so you could have eight times 12 96 different meals and it really wasn't until I actually I you know I, I learned this in a Chinese restaurant and it amazed me later on to discover that yes it had the name the Chinese restaurant principle uh, so th this is also the kind of argument that you use to prove that there are n factorial ways of ordering n objects and yep. uh, n, n choose k ways of choosing k things from n. You, you, you figure out how many ways can, to choose the first thing, how many ways to choose the second, multiply those together, how many ways to choose the third, multiply again, and so on and so on. Uh, as far as I know, this, this goes back to medieval times. There was... Um, a mathematician in what what is now Spain, Levi Ben Gershon, who worked out the number of permutations and combinations of of n things or n 
choosing K things from N. I think he was the first, and that's probably the first instance of the the this multiplying principle of uh, that you would use in the Chinese restaurant. You know, that's one of the things that I really enjoyed about reading your book, because it is sort of a history of mathematics. And you come across people like until, you know, I had never heard of Levi Ben Gershon. Um, And there are a lot of interesting people in mathematics whom, because I mean, mathematics has been going on for thousands of years, that there are going to be a lot of interesting people that you've never heard of. And you come across some of them and some of the anecdotes in your book, which is another reason that I enjoyed reading it. Uh, yes, I, I, th- I think it is uh, uh, entertaining and interesting that sometimes important contributions were made by obscure people. Of, of course, it's, it's mostly the Newtons and the Eulers and the, the Archimedes who come up with the big discoveries. But once, it, once in a while, something comes from nowhere. In a way, Galois was like that. You know, we and, talked earlier. We very, very briefly touched on Alan Turing, but I'd like to touch. Uh, I'd like to talk a little more about him in a different context. One of the first major problems in the theory of computers was the halting problem. Two different approaches were taken to solving this problem, but certainly the one adopted by Alan Turing involved a distinctly different type of proof. And perhaps you could talk a little about this. Uh, yeah, yes, I could. Um, Turing used the diagonal argument, and he considered computers which had writing, a a strip of paper to write things on. So you could write, for instance, the decimal expansion of root 2. You could write a 1, and then a dot, and then a 1, 4, 1, 4, and so on. Uh, And he he asked the question, um, what are the computable numbers? They will include all the rational numbers. They'll include a lot of irrational numbers, like root 2 and pi, because we know ways of computing them. Uh, but he also asked, if you're given a machine, which is like being given a computer program uh, in today's language, can you tell whether this program will compute a real number? Because you can set it running and you can watch what it does, and it might write a one and a dot and a one, four, one, four. But if you wait long enough, it might go back and erase all it's done. done. You don't know. Um, no matter how long you look at the machine, you don't know whether it's going to compute a real number or not. And this can be this can be formalized by the diagonal argument. You can indeed show there is no algorithm or machine that will recognize the machines that print real numbers. And and why not? Well, it turns out that the problem is knowing whether the machine is going to halt or not. If you, if you could settle that question, you'll be able to settle the question about real numbers. So Turing realized this means that the halting problem is not solvable. And and many other unsolvable problems follow from this. Problems in logic and group theory and topology, number theory, uh, all sorts of unsolvable problems have since been found uh, as descendants of this unsolvable halting problem. You know, one of the truly counterintuitive results in mathematics is the Bonnach-Tarski theorem, which relies heavily on the axiom of choice. Uh, Could you talk a little about the Bonnach-Tarski theorem and what is the axiom of choice and how does it make an appearance in proofs? Um, The Bonnach-Tarski theorem is indeed a very paradoxical sounding theorem. It says that if you take a solid ball, um, say... um, a meter in diameter, you can decompose that into a finite number of parts. I believe five is is possible, and put those parts together without stretching or, or bending them in any way, just moving them in rigidly in space. You can put them together to form two balls the same size as the original. So in theory, you could take a, uh, a ball the, say, the size of a pea, say, and make two peas and three peas and uh, a million peas and a billion peas. You could eventually make uh, a volume the size of the sun simply by decomposing and rearranging the pieces. Now, this sounds absurd, I know, uh, and it's not the kind of decomposition you could make by cutting with a knife, but nevertheless, there is some decomposition of the, of the ball into clouds of points you think maybe red points and blue points and green points and so forth, Uh, very cloudy-looking sets, uh, 
these sets exist according to the axiom of choice. Now, what does the axiom of choice say? Well, to give a simple example, um, everybody, and to take the sort of opposite end of an axiom of choice theorem, everybody will agree that if you've got an infinite set, you can choose an element from it and then choose an element from what's left and choose an element from what's left of that and so on. And you can keep on going forever if this is an infinite set. So this tells you that every infinite set contains a countable subset, a set that has a first member, second member, third member, and so on. That sounds completely plausible. Nevertheless, we had to make infinitely many choices to prove that theorem. And it, it really is an instance of the axiom of choice. You cannot prove that theorem without some kind of choice principle. There is no way to define this countable subset. Now, the axiom of choice is a, somewhat of a generalization of that idea, but not a big generalization. It's about choosing from infinitely many sets. And it just says you can. Uh, but surprisingly, it has these paradoxical and some might say unacceptable consequences about uh, one ball being equal to two balls and, and that sort of thing. Um, as a result, um, some mathematicians dispute the axiom of choice say, or, or say we shouldn't use this axiom. And others say, okay, we, we admit you have to use it because it does simplify mathematics a lot. A lot of the things that we want to be true in mathematics, like every vector space has a basis, every ring has a maximal ideas, things that algebraists constantly appeal to, uh, actually depend on the axiom of choice. So on the one hand, it's very convenient, even necessary for the mathematics that some people do. On the other hand, it has unpleasant consequences uh, from the point of view of many mathematicians. So uh, as long as you say this is an axiom, certain things follow from it, certain things don't follow if, unless you accept the axiom of choice, that's, that's about where it stands at the moment. We do know that it's not possible. It's somewhat like the parallel axiom in geometry. It's not possible to prove it from more elementary axioms. Um, perhaps you'd care to, uh, care to comment on what I heard. Does, an, uh, I can't remember who did this, but it was a, in, a British mathematician, I think, in the early 20th century. Dis maybe it was Bertrand Russell. Um, Describe the problem with the axiom of choice as saying, if I give you a pair of shoes, you can give me a rule on choosing one of the shoes. Say, take the left shoe. But if I give you a pair of socks... You can't give me a rule that will tell me which did that will tell me how to choose a sock. That precise, that's precisely it. Yes, if if you have infinitely many pairs of socks, the axiom of choice says there's a set that contains one member of each pair. But there, as you say, there is no rule for describing this set, and that's what many people object, object to in the axiom of choice. They like things to be describable by some definition or rule. Yeah, it, it's fascinating stuff. Um, you know, another thing about your book that uh, um, it's a theme that goes continually through the book is that you often see theorems that you think are in a specific area of mathematics that are proved using quite different tools from a different area of mathematics. The first proof I saw of the fundamental theorem of algebra required complex variables. Is there a strictly algebraic proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra? I... I don't. I don't believe there is. Um, I'm not sure whether this this ap apparent fact is provable in some sense, but um, but in a sense, yeah, it has to. It has to involve some concepts from analysis because the very concept of complex number, uh, like the concept of real number, in, involves infinity in a big way. So if if you want your your fundamental theorem of algebra to say every polynomial has a root in the complex numbers, then it's not so surprising that analysis would come into it. It, it is somewhat surprising, but uh, you sort of underestimate the complexity of the concept of complex numbers. Now, there is an alternative, which is due to Kronecker, because Kronecker, as, as I've mentioned 
didn't like big infinities and he didn't like uh, proofs that didn't construct the object that's claimed to exist. He had a different proof which says that every polynomial has a root in a certain field, not necessarily the complex numbers, but a field which is, he is easily able to define. And the, the definition is... Uh, I, I, I describe it in the book, but it, it has to do with equivalence classes of polynomials. You start with your original polynomial whose root you're seeking, and you consider all other polynomials modulo that that polynomial. And these this gives congruence classes, and these form a field, uh, as you're able to show. And this is the field that Kronecker thinks... Uh, you should be looking in to find the root of the polynomial. He call, called this uh, the fundamental theorem of general arithmetic, and it, it was his um, opponent to the fundamental theorem of algebra. Okay, that's sort of interesting, um, because you can sort of see that what people are, uh, are talking about is that when we have our limited view of algebra, you know, the type of view of algebra that you get when you go into high school and they talk about polynomials, that there's obviously larger, these structures are in some way incomplete, I, you know, using the word incomplete vaguely, and that you yeah. need larger structures in order to sense the full completeness of the the things that you're talking about yes and that and that was one of Kronecker's Con- uh, contributions he, he he found structures that 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 uh, do complete the the theory of polynomials but they complete it in a constructive sort of way you can describe uh, they're not uncountable for instance they're countable and you can describe their members in a, in a, in a fairly concrete and explicit way um, another great theorem is the prime number theorem, and it's a statement about how the primes are distributed among the integers. And as we know, mathematicians are fascinated by primes. Why is the prime number theorem important, and why do we care how the primes are distributed? And were there any interesting proofs encountered along the way to proving this result? Um, yes, I, su- I suppose this is a matter of curiosity, uh, but also the fact that famous mathematicians such as Gauss thought about it and and conjectured about it but were not able to prove it and uh, there's the the general mysteriousness of primes we know there are infinitely many of them but they form such an irregular sequence that uh, it's it is difficult to visualize and and the density of the sequence is difficult to uh, estimate and so the prime number theorem was a great triumph in describing in an asymptotic way how many primes are among the first n numbers. Um, and it was a hard theorem to prove. Uh, it, it used complex analysis, uh, as, you, as you mentioned before. Uh, the, the fundamental theorem of algebra also uses. Um, um, and for a long time, it was thought the complex analysis was necessary. G.H. Hardy... Um, the English mathematician from early 20th century, uh, conjectured that it was not possible to prove the prime number theorem without using complex analysis. This was later found found out to be false. And in the 1940s, Selberg and Erdos both um, produced so-called elementary proofs of the prime number theorem, proofs that in principle use just natural numbers, that, but they use them in a way that's kind of guided by analysis. And, and their proof is not any easier. If anything, it's harder than the ones using complex analysis. So it's still a somewhat mysterious theorem. And um, uh, one recent uh, tidbit about the prime number theorem that I know a colleague of mine spent a whole summer rewriting the proof of the prime number theorem so that it could be checked by computer. This this has become a thing recently where big and complex proofs, uh, mathematicians have become uncertain about their correctness unless they're checked by computer. And just writing the proof of the prime number theorem so that it can be checked by a computer is a whole summer's worth of work. Well, you know, uh, we're coming to the end of the uh, interview, and 
what you just said leads into one of the most uh, interesting results in mathematics in the 20th century, the bombshell result that no one expected, Gödel's result that there exist undecidable propositions. And the proof has an interesting history involving the mechanization of the possibility of proving things. And so what is an undecidable proposition and how did Gerdell go about proving this result? Um, first, I should say that um, an undecidable proposition is undecidable in a relative sense. You can say something is undecidable relative to, say, Euclidean geometry or Euclid's axiom or to Piano's axioms for natural uh, for number theory um, because if that means that this proposition let's call it p cannot be proved or disproved in the the given axiom system let's call the axiom system s but of course if so it would be s would remain consistent if you added this p to it as a new axiom so uh, th this means p is decidable relative to itself if, if you take it as an axiom which you're you're free to do since it, it can't be disproved uh then it is provable so undecidability is a relative concept it just says certain given a certain axiom system s there may be propositions not provable or disprovable by s but the interesting thing is as you say girdle um showed that this is true of number theory if you take say the piano axioms for number theory there are certain statements p of number theory such that neither p nor its negation is provable in in the piano piano axioms and this was a big surprise because uh, I, I mentioned euclid's axioms before i think it's true that that every statement you can make in the language of geometry is either provable or disprovable in, in Euclid's axioms. So there's no incompleteness there. Number theory, d despite being a seemingly very elementary part of mathematics, is incomplete. The undecidable, the known undecidable statements, unfortunately, uh, are none of the ones that, that mathematicians have have struggle with they, they they were invented by logicians and and mathematicians as as a whole have not been terribly fascinated by them nevertheless it is true that not everything can be proved in in number theory no matter what system you take as long as it's consistent there will be some things that it fails to prove and this this was Gödel's big result and he proved it uh, as you mentioned by uh, establishing a kind of parallel between logic and computation. He showed that logic could be arithmetized. Anything you did with logic, um, reasoning, mathematical reasoning, could be simulated by a computation with numbers. And because of this, he was able to prove it, the incompleteness of number theory. You know, John, I strongly recommend to any listener who's really interested in an in-depth history of mathematics, it's a, sort of a lot more fun reading um, reading the story of proof than, say, going through the four-volume world of mathematics that I went through when I was younger. Um, so it's a valuable addition to that field. John, if someone wants to get, if a listener would like to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Uh, they could email me. Uh, my email is stillwell at usfca.edu. That's, that's probably the best way. Okay. And also, do you have any other projects on the horizon that you might come back and talk to us about? Uh, I'm thinking about write, writing a kind of parallel book on the concepts of mathematics rather than the, uh, the methods of proof. Uh, I, I touch on various concepts in the story of proof, but I, n not in a systematic way. And eventually I'd like to write a book that's more systematic in uh, describing the evolution of mathematical concepts. Uh, an interesting idea, which I think will take you quite some time to do it. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> John, it's been a pleasure, and uh, thanks for, you know, thanks for uh, coming on the show. Take care. Thanks for having me, Jim.